tonight, it is my great honor and pleasure to, produce, to introduce to you uh, Professor David C. Lane. Uh, Professor Lane uh, got, received his master's and PhD in sociology uh, with a, sp a specialization in sociology of knowledge from University of California, San Diego. Uh, he also received his, his MA in history and phenomenology of religion from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. He's previously taught at University of California, San Diego, where he was a recipient of a Regents Fellowship. Uh, also taught at Cal State Long Beach, uh, California School of Professional Psychology, University of London in England, and among other institutions. And he is currently the, a professor of philosophy at Mount San Antonio College in Walnut. Uh, professor Lane has written many books and booklets and articles, including Why I Don't Eat Faces, A Neuroethical Argument for Vegetarianism, in 1993, which was later incorporated into a short film. Uh, he's written skeptical articles on the uh, Rigu Samhita, a purported ancient astrological treatise in India. And he has other works on topics ranging from UFOs to religious visions to the purported miracles of Indian guru Satya Sai Baba. Uh, his recent work focuses on evolutionary, psychology, evolutionary philosophy, neuroscience, quantum theory, and consciousness. And he's produced over 100 short films, including Virtual Geometry, Moving Water, Is the Universe an App, Inner Visions and Running Trains, Evolution Explained in Four Minutes, Ooh. The Quantum Mechanical Basis of Photosynthesis, and many more. Uh, Professor Lane is also an avid body surfer and surfer. <laughs> he won the World Body Surfing Contest in 1999, and the International Body Surfing Contest he's won eight times from 1997 to 2016. Hell yeah. Tonight he will be presenting a talk called The Virtual Reality of Consciousness, a Gnostic Insight, integrating insights gleaned from evolutionary biology, neuroscience, and the burgeoning field of virtual reality technologies. So, uh, if you'll all please give a warm UCI welcome to <laughs> It's really nice for you guys to show up. And by the way, a couple things in my mind. Number one, let me just set up the thing about the miracles and Satya Sai Baba. It was skeptical. You know, I was basically arguing that he was doing Sai Baba. So, no. Okay, a number of things on my mind. Number one, this talk is about virtual reality, but it's also about consciousness. So let me set you up. I was teaching at UC San Diego back in the 80s, probably before anybody was born. Right, maybe your grandparents were still alive. And what happened was, I was an arrogant SOP. Teaching at Warren College writing program, I had this idea because I studied Eastern philosophy. That was yes. my forte, right? I'd gone to India many times. I was with Professor Jurgen Martin, pretty famous in global studies at UC Santa Barbara. I was his research assistant to track down obscure yogis and gurus in North India. It was kind of cool. You know, I was 21 years old, going through North <laughs> India, meeting these yogis, these gurus, you know, they meditate. So I had this kind of idea of consciousness first. You may have heard from Donald Hoffman. He's a professor here. And he's made this argument that consciousness is the fundamental. Materialism is second. You get my drift? Yeah. So I'm teaching basically this thing. And I had this very famous student. He's now famous. His name is Tom Wagon. And you can check him on the internet. He's a, he's a really good surfer. He lives in Australia. He makes these old Maya surfboards. Well, he was a student of mine at Warren College. And he was also taking Patricia Churchill. You may have heard of Patricia Churchill. She's famous for neurophilosophy. Her husband, Paul Churchill. So I'm teaching this thing, and he's taking her class, and she's all into eliminative materials. The argument is, is that you're just three pounds of glorious water and tissue. You are this piece of meat. You are the boy. So he, Tom would come to the class. He would come over to my class, right? And I'm in Warren College. I'm young. Churchill's had just showed up. They're really hot. She studied at Oxford. So she comes over, and he comes over to me, and he says, Lane, you're full of crap. This, this first consciousness that we're just conscious, you're just full of it. So I would argue against Churchill. He would go back to Patricia and tell her, you know, Dave says this. And she goes, who's that loser? What does he know, right? So it goes back and forth. And the reason I'm saying this is because I converted to Churchill. I was wrong. She was right. But wait a second. Things changed. And I'll tell you how it happened. What Churchill was arguing was, the thing, what I call the remainder of conjecture. The argument is a real simple one. We're trying to understand consciousness. You know? Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, wouldn't it be really good if we could reverse engineer the brain? Right now, at the Allen Institute, he, Paul Allen just recently died, he's the co-founder of Microsoft, along with Bill Gates. He spent all this money to understand the brain. So he invites Christoph Koch, 
very famous neuroscientist uh, from Caltech, to see if they could reverse engineer the brain, 86 billion neurons, some people say 100 billion neurons, trillions of synapses, axions, dendrites, all that thing, to understand the model. If, however, you could understand that model, could you replicate it in something that's not biological weapon? That is, is it substrate neutral? That's the argument that Tononi and others have done for this ITT. Okay. So the argument is, could we take consciousness, understand it as mathematics, Max Tech, Mark's book, Mathematical Universe, and then transfer it over to, like, like Ray Kurzweil, put it on the computer, upload ourselves to a website, which my kids want to do because they don't want me to die, you know, mm -hmm. Homer Simpson on some, some website. Well, here's what happened to me. I go to India, and I meet this very interesting guru who had meditated for 70 years, practicing a near-death experience based on this notion of Shabbat Yoga. His name is Fakir Chan. You've got to watch how he pronounce his name. And he was meditating for 70 years. And what had happened is he would consciously induce a near-death experience, make his body go numb. You know how you have some people have sleep paralysis? He would just go with it. So he would go like this numb thing and then leave his body or claim to leave his body and have all these visions, experiences, you know, see Rama, Krishna, all sorts of interesting things. But something happened. In 1918, when he was posted in the Bazar of Baghdad, World, at the very end of World War I, his friends started having visions of him when they were under stress. And they come to Fakir Chan and say, Oh, Baba Fakir Chan, I didn't see our guru, I didn't see Rama, I saw you. You showed up and saved our lives. And then Fakir Chan said, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't appear to these people. And so the light went on. And he began to realize that religious visions were projections of his own mind or the minds of other people. So he started to change his view about consciousness. This caused me to think, because for 30 years, I've been trying to study the secret of consciousness. I had gone to that consciousness first position. I thought, you know, it's, consciousness is the most fundamental thing. But something happened. My wife was also at UCSD. She studied with a guy named V.S. Ramachandran. You may have heard of that. He's the guy with the phantom limb effect. That is, you don't have an arm. Patients still feel pain in their arm, even if they don't have it, because the brain still has a map of it. Well, she was working as his research assistant on visual perception. And I started reading some of his, his writings early on. And then she met a guy named, you've heard of him, Francis Crick. Francis Crick is the co-discoverer of the double helix structure to deoxide of acid DNA, yeah. with, along with James Watson, and very famous. And she didn't know him. She met him at a party and thought he was a guy working as a janitor who had no job. So they debated for two freaking hours. She had no idea who he was, and she was just dogging the guy. And then finally she came home to me, and she goes, have you ever heard of this guy named Francis? I go, it couldn't have been Francis Crick, was it? She goes, huh? what? And she was totally embarrassed. Well, the fun part about this is Crick had just published a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis in 1994 in which he said, we're just a bundle of neurons, basically reducing us intra-theoretically back to the brain. Well, I wasn't convinced. But there's another guy named Gerald Edelman, another Nobel Prize winner in medicine, who had written a very interesting book called Second Nature. And as I was reading him, I was reading Fakir Chan, I was reading Patricia Churchland, and I was reading all these interesting people, I came home and the light went Because I couldn't understand why human beings had evolved consciousness. I mean, Darwin, obviously, in his On Origin of Species, 1859 book, explains everything pretty well, right? Daniel Dennett, in his 1995 book, basically says Darwin's dangerous idea, the greatest single idea ever thought about, about a single human being, it's a universal asset, explains everything. But the one thing I didn't think of, because finding out from Russell Wallace, who's also the co-discoverer of natural selection and evolution, he didn't believe it either, if you remember. Him and Darwin, part of company trying to explain the mind. Hmm. But I came home one day and I looked at Andrea and I said, I get it. It's so obvious why consciousness evolved in human beings. And here's the very simple argument. What, in fact, even as I talk, I can probably prove this thesis to you. What does your brain do most of the time when you're in a lecture or listening to somebody or you're on a bad day? You know what you do. You space out. You simulate all sorts of weird things, whether it's going to happen in the future, whether you have to take a whiz right now and you're thinking about how to get out of here. All sorts of things happen in your brain. 
The question then arises, to what advantage from a Darwinian perspective is it to our advantage to have this consciousness be a virtual simulator? And that's what I'm arguing. Consciousness evolved in any, any organism that can develop the ability to insource within its own structure various possibilities before outsourcing it, you know, before actually doing it in the real world, has an advantage. I'll give you three examples. Let's imagine we're on an airplane, 740, no, 737, sorry. We're on a bad airplane, okay? and everybody on the airplane, the pilots are dead, everybody's dead, except for, you know, the stewardess is alive, and we're alive, and I'm sitting there, and there's a 14-year-old kid next to me on an, on an iPad, and they're asking somebody to fly the plane. Now, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, right? I'm just a philosophy guy. And she goes, does anybody know? Well, this kid has an iPad. And he's been playing a flight simulator game for the last two years. And he's really good at it. And he's mocked up 747s, 737s, another airplane. Now ask yourself a question. Who are you going to pick? Me or this kid who's 14 years old to fly that plane? I think we know the answer. Let's go to the second scenario. This is a little more sexist, I apologize. But let's imagine a guy wants to ask out a girl for a date. Okay? Now, there are two kinds of ways you can do it. One, you can just go up to the girl, right, and simply say, I want to pass my genetic code and let's get horizontal, right? That could be <laughs> awesome. It might work. I, the guys are writing it down right now. It might work. Yeah. Or, uh, finally, I'm sure I showed up to this lecture. Um, and then, or the second one would be this. Especially if you like the girl. You will play out various scenarios in your freaking head. Oh, I can say this. You can say this, you can go up to her and say, you know, uh, are you into astronomy? You know, are you into astronomy? She goes, really? She goes, well, I, I, I've been studying it and I was, there was a star missing from last night. I was looking for it until I saw you. And oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my point I'm trying to make, though, is we already have a word for that kind of guy. And it's not necessarily good. We say he's got aid. We, and if he's really bad, we say he's a player. Now let's go to the third one. The third one's a little different, but I think this goes to our evolutionary past. Let's go back 100,000 years ago to the Serengeti plane. And let's imagine two kinds of people, an animator and a non-animator. An animator is simply a person who projects all sorts of weird things when he hears the wrestling of the bushes. And the bushes wrestle and he goes, oh, it's a lion, it's a tiger, it's a bear, oh my. Then there's the other guy, the non-animator, who's just like that. A hundred times, nothing happened. Right? Then the animator's wrong. It's always just the wind or whatever. But on the hundred and first time, there's a lion. Guess who gets eaten? Reactionary. Exactly. No, the guy who didn't animate. Because the, the animator will do when he has to, he runs. He goes, oh, I'm gonna let it. The non-animator just sitting there. He gets eaten. Sounds a little weird, I'm gonna exaggerate a little. Who are we the descendants of? We're descendants of those people that can animate, who can simulate possibilities, here comes the punchline, that are not in the present moment. And in fact, if you look at human beings, the reason we're miserable, 7 billion people on this planet, is because we're mostly in our head all the time. Very rarely are we in the present moment. If you go to Huntington Beach, go to Dog Beach, go look at dogs. They're like the total present moment. Right? <laughs> you don't get a bunch of dogs in a group at UCI philosophy. That, I'm a dog. You know, what are they doing? They sniff other dogs. <laughs> they don't do that. So the question that arises, if, what's the one advantage that human beings have fundamentally over other animals? It's not surfing. Dolphins are much better than iron. It's not the way we hunt. Tigers are better than we are. It's not even building dams. Beavers are better than we are. What is the one thing we do? We see so many things. Now, there's a plus to this, and there's a downside. And the downside is, well, two, two stories. About 25 years ago, at Mount Sac, I had a student named Laura, and she suffered from all these, I wouldn't say multiple personalities, because that's technically not correct, but I would say disassociative personalities. So one day I get a call from health services at Mount Sac asking me, can we kick her out of Mount Sac? And I said, why? And they said, back, and this is 25 years ago, where they used these different words. She was, she's been diagnosed very famously 
with 31 different personalities. And they go, it's freaking everybody out because sometimes she would dress up as a, you know, some white skateboarder from Huntington Beach, you know, at 41 years old at Levi's and scare the crap out of people. Other times in my class, she dressed up as a British school mom. She would dress up like a white Bernie. And the way I talk, you can tell, you know, like this. She's like, mm, very improper. And then after the talk, after my lecture, she'd meet me in the office and her hair would be down. She must have had a van on the side And she'd act like a super organic man. You and I had karma. What the going on? So they asked me, and I said, nah, don't worry about it. I got like five different personalities myself. What's the difference between 31 and 5? Right? So I found out. It's a sad story. She got raped systematically by her stepfather when she was six years old. She also had her back broken, and she was stuck in a closet for a year and a half when she was a young kid. Now just play that out of your head. If you remember Albert Camus' very famous philosophical line, he said there's only one great philosophical whether to commit suicide. Shakespeare, of course, predates that. And Hamlet says, to be or not to be. And from a Darwinian perspective, as everybody in this room knows, basically, you live long enough to do what? Pass on your genetic code. And what does nature do after you pass on your genetic code? You get old like me, after you've had your two kids, and they say, fuck you out of here. And you just get really melty, and you straighten her out, right? I mean, it's a little blunt, but you get my drift. So let's play this out. If you're going to survive what I call the hunger game, because this is the hunger game. Everybody eats one another, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, whether it's another human being. It's a fairly torturous place. So how do you survive it? Well, we came up with this concept called ME, or meaning. It's called meaning equivalent. I'll, I'll give you a quote. Any meaning is better than no meaning, even if such, mean, such meaning is nonsense, Provided that such meaning makes you live an extra day. Mm -hmm. Any meaning is better than no meaning. This is why, by the way, there's thousands of religions, not just one. That's why Tom Cruise can get through Scientology, because it doesn't matter what you believe, it's that you believe. Mm -hmm. So from a uh, from Camus perspective, that would get you across the line, to live long enough to pass on your Fine. So let's go back to Barbara. How do you survive in a closet after you've been systematically raped by your stepfather? Your back is broken, and you're in a dark closet. What the fudge do you do? You already got the answer. You simulate in ways that we can't even appreciate. You disassociate. So you develop these different personas, like, and you just occupy. And I eventually got to know her. And I will love Edward O. Wilson from Harvard University. He's a emeritus professor, very famous, won the Pulitzer twice. He's probably one of the great scientists of the 20th century. Because she contacted him, and he talked to her for an hour. And convinced her to go and study biology at UC San Diego, which she eventually did, got her master's. And all her personalities, or this associated personality, started to lessen. They're still there, but they got less of them. So, well, what's my point here? Well, the point is there's a, also another downside. About 10 years ago, I had a student in my class who suffered from schizophrenia. He had not left his, class, uh, his room, or his house, he said, for 20 years. He couldn't even look at it. He was like, so I come up to me and he'd have his head down. And, I said, uh, what's up, bro? And he wouldn't talk. So one day I talked about the virtual simulation hypothesis. This is what the brain does. It simulates. The problem is the brain has to trick you to believe it. Because if you don't believe it enough, you won't act on it. So what happened to him, he went, came to me after class, he goes, oh, I get it. That's what I do in my room. Somebody brings a TV set in, or somebody brings a dish in. I simulate that there's germs from their hands. And those germs go down the table and on the floor, and they come crawling up, and it, it, it incapacitates them. He gets so caught in his simulations. Now, if I'm correct in this hypothesis, and it's not mine, I've ripped it off in my seven. What's my claim? Um, he, if I'm correct on this, you can actually prove it. What would be the very first stage of virtual simulation? Well, we already know the answer. Freud figured it out, although he's. He's a bad scientist and a good novelist, and we'll go there. Um, he, he figured this out in the last part of the Dreams. What do you do in a dream? You've got no incoming data streams. What does the brain do? You simulate it. John Lilly, in the 1950s, he's pretty famous for his study on LSD and ketamine. He developed, and also study of dolphins, he developed these deprivation tanks back in the 50s. And he, would go and he wanted to know. They didn't know. They, they actually had this idea that if you had no sensory input, your brain would just, just go blank. Turns out to be the opposite. 
you hallucinate in amazing. So he wrote this book called The Center of the Cyclone. If you get a chance to read it, it's scary. So he started taking ketamine and LSD 25 inside these deprivation games. And he's just hallucinating unbelievable. When he started to believe his hallucinations, like there's UFOs and aliens from other planets. And even Richard Feynman, a very famous Nobel Prize winner for his quantum electrodynamics at, at Caltech, he also took LSD and he also did the deprivation games. Although he's much more of a skeptic and realized it's projections of his own mind. What am I trying to get to here? Well, here's the problem. This is why we're somewhat miserable. If you think about your life right now, think about the happiest moment you've ever had. I can almost guarantee you one thing. You were not in your head. You were in the moment. Whatever that moment may be, it could be Disneyland, it could be you know, a good restaurant, it could be your lover, it could be anything, but you're there. And the more you're there, you're not disassociated. So what does Ed Edelman develop? He develops this concept, which is really cool, called first nature and second nature, or association and disassociation. First nature is when you're in the present moment. We apparently share that with all animals. Second nature, disassociation, is we probably share pretty clearly with other primates, probably dolphins, whales. We're not actually sure. I'm sure dogs have to some degree. I don't want to like, you know, like reduce the, you know, animal consciousness and do a kind of Cartesian thing and say they don't suffer on five to five seconds. However, we have language. We have this huge brain. And what's happened to us is that we get caught in disassociation. So let's make a, a, an argument and see if it's true. Disassociation, that is spacing out of the past and the future, can be to your evolutionary advantage. If you take these disassociations, these projections, these imaginations, and you test it in the real world, right? that is, you compete against other people and say, well, it works. Mm -hmm. The downfall is when you actually believe your disassociations with no competition and no testing. We've seen this with many religious visionaries. Mm -hmm. You know, they get the vision, they see the thing, everybody else believes them, but nobody ever tests it. And we see this even now in various mental hospitals. We see it with ourselves. You know, we, we buy our own stuff. You know, people think that this guy really loves you, but he really doesn't. Some think, think this girl really likes me, but she really doesn't. I see it even with my students. I'll, I'll be walking down the campus one day, and I'll probably go to get a coke or something. And this kid walks by, and I'm kind of in my head, you know, thinking about something. So, and he walks by. And he comes to my office later. He goes, hey, Link, because I know you're mad at me. I didn't do good. Yes. I look, dude, I'm really bad at names. I know your face, but really? And he goes, well, I just saw you, man. Give me that eye. <laughs> the eye? I was, I was thinking about where, that coat is warm. Uh, whatever. <laughs> I think we all do that. Do you understand? We all project. You know, Freud, the one great discovery, we could say, is transformed. In fact, he did say that. It turned out he was doing these patients in Vienna, and they would, about four or five months into the, into the therapy, they would project on him. Oh, you're the greatest, you're better than my husband, or you're just sick, you're the worst person. And there were, there were his projections. But Kirchhoff gave a very interesting analogy along these lines. He said, imagine, and I'll try to make this uh, different, let's imagine a really handsome man walks by right now. And that handsome man looks at you, and you kind of get that feeling of, wow, maybe I still got it, right? And all of a sudden, you look closer, and you say, oh, that's, God, that's my dad. You know, but then you look even closer, right? It's not even a guy. It's a girl. <laughs> okay? Now, what? The person never changed. What changed? Our perception. Our projection. So, okay. Now, let's move this on a little further. So, I'm pretty convinced that the virtual simulation hypothesis of consciousness would explain from the Darwinian perspective about why it evolved in the first place. It makes a lot of sense. Therefore, I'm kind of switching from the you know, first consciousness first position into a more materialist understanding, you know, whether consciousness is substrate neutral and why Darwin would explain it. However, you have a professor here named Donald Hawk. Pretty famous guy, pretty interesting, very controversial. And he made a very interesting analogy. He said, wait a second. You're not seeing the world as it is. You're only stuck at the user interface, like in your iPhone. When you look at your iPhone or, or smartphone, whatever it is, you're looking at the user interface. But you don't know the programming that goes underneath it, which is at the second level. But the real level is the movement of electrons and electron gates using what we know, Boolean logic, 
you know, from one thing to another thing, either or and. So you're not seeing it. In fact, it's like the matrix. You don't see what's underneath it. You just see the surface and react accordingly. Well, he thinks that the computer desktop has given us the best analogy of consciousness. Why? Because he says, when you're on the, like I'm on my iMac, I, I and I want to dump some files. There's a little trash can over here. I take my files. Now, is it really a trash can? No. Do I think there's a trash can? Yeah, because that's why I'm moving the frickin' files. Is there a real consequence to me putting the files into the trash can? Uh, come on in. No, she's smart. She's I'm just keep it. Keep it. <laughs> you have to see, I'm going to go get something to drink. So what happened is, is in his case, he makes the argument, we think the icon is really telling you what's going to go. And so, so we're just talking about Donald Hoffman at UCI, very interesting professor of cognitive science. And he's talking about consciousness, and he makes this argument that we're being manipulated by the user interface, which is our brain, right? So, all right, so I'm reading it, and I think that's kind of interesting. Wow. This is what changes me. About, about 30 years ago, my sister and I, I was teaching at the University of London back in those days, and we tried virtual reality for the first time. And it sucked. It was so bad. Jeremy Lanier, who's a very famous founder, more or less, of virtual reality, you'd pay 20 bucks with a big, bulky headset on. Uh, my sister and I go, ah, forget it. And I thought, nothing up. However, and you'll see why this is going to connect to Hoffman, you'll see how this connects to virtual reality, this also connects to quantum theory, Roger Penrose, a whole set of things. About, I guess it was six years ago, Google Cardboard came out. You guys may remember this. You put your smartphone, you stick it in a cardboard box for five bucks, and my son, you know, my sons are all nerdy, you know, all the computers and stuff. So you go, hey, Papa, try, no, in a good way, you know, because I'm a good way. <laughs> so they say, they say, here's the card, so I put it on. And I'm blown away. I mean, this is the simple, rudimentary device. And I went, oh, crap. This is pretty good. So then we got invested in a thing called Oculus Rift. Yeah. Apparently, there's some rumors, and I don't think it's true. There's a guy named Palmer Lucky who went to Cal State Long Beach when I was teaching there at the same time. Whether he took one of my courses, I doubt it. I wouldn't take one of my courses. No. And so Palmer Lucky, very smart kid develops this virtual reality thing called the Oculus Rift. Now, interestingly enough, he sells the company to Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg gets mesmerized by it, for nearly $3 billion, which is unbelievable. He eventually got fired, but we all know something about Donald Trump. <laughs> so, I tried the Oculus Rift when it first came out, because I'm going to tend to adopt you know, the latest technology. I was blown away by it. But the problem was you had to have a high-end computer to it. You have to attach it, you have to tell it. As I did this, my brain started thinking, what are we trying to do here with virtual reality? I know exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to do, we're trying to actualize our imagination. You, know, you have an imagination, all sorts of things. What you really like to do is see it. Now you know in Disneyland, they just built this for a billion dollars, the Star Wars land. What are they really trying to do? It's an imaginative thing developed by Lucas in the last part of the 1970s. What are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to create something. So you go there and you feel like you're in another world. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, virtual reality does it for like nothing. You stick the headset on, boom, you're in another world. In fact, I just got the Oculus Quest a couple days ago, which is the latest iteration, of it, which is not tethered. I was so blown away. My wife tried it. So blown away, I thought it was another world. I go, this is like I live in a parallel universe. It's so amazing. But then I started to hypothesize. I said, wait a second. Donald Hoffman said that the, the desktop was a good analogy to explain consciousness. I'm here to tell you, uh -uh. it's a very simplistic virtual reality is the model. Why? Because it's all inclusive. So I then started saying to myself, wait a second. Elon Musk, as you know from Tesla, has made an argument that we're already living in a virtual reality. You know, he's 99.9% .9 convinced mm -hmm. that this is not based real. He's going to take somebody like uh, Nick Bostrom at the University of Oxford, who wrote the book Superintelligence. He's a professor of philosophy, and he's made the argument that the hypothesis is most likely we are in a simulation. Now, if you told me this back in 65, 75, 85, what's that science fiction? 
this is crap, I can't buy it. Now that I've tried the Oculus Quest, now that I've done virtual reality, now I've gone to these conferences for Oculus 5 and all that stuff, I'm like going, wait a second. What's the best VR headset ever developed in the history of human life? The brain. Our brain is the best VR headset there ever was. And the funny thing is, guys, Plato knew this back in the day when he came up with the allegory of the cave. Even though he didn't know the technology, he didn't know the neuroscience, we now have a better model for what our brain is doing. And you and I have never seen and never touched reality ever. The only thing we've ever experienced, this gets a little weird, a little philosophical, a little strange. I'm in your head right now. I know, you all like, get out of my head. I don't need that. Take another hit, just a jump. Now, my point being, watch. The light cascades off this old man's body. And it bounces off, right? And this electromagnetic spectrum, which is really tiny. You know, you're only getting like, I can't even describe less than 1% of what the electromagnetic spectrum possibilities are. It then hits your eyes, hits the rods and the cones, and goes to the optic nerve. And what then happens is no longer light. It's chemical electrical signals, pretty slow. That's why a calculator is faster than us on that. And it goes back to the visual cortex. It does this holographic thing which is the recording of interference wave-like patterns around a given object. It does a Fourier analysis. It does a reverse inside image. Boom! It's in the back of your head. In fact, you've never experienced anything outside of your skull, ever. Now, I'm not denying there's not incoming stimuli. I'm not one of those guys. I'm not doing a shirt with a claim 1983 out on a limb. And, hey, it's all you. No, I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing, however, is that your brain is transfiguring. I'll put this a little differently. Your brain is a hack. Evolution developed a hack, a way to bypass all this incredible information. Because if we had all the information of the electromagnetic spectrum, we not only wouldn't exist, we'd be catatonic. So what does nature do? Nature lies. And says, no, I'm only going to give you little bits of information, and I'm going to deceive you. And why am I going to deceive you? Because there's only one prime directive. You know, Darwin made a mistake. He did, actually. In his fifth edition on the, on the Origin of Species, which changed the title to The Origin of Species, he was influenced by a guy named Herbert Spencer. He never liked the term natural selection. And he was right to, because it, it, it sounds like nature is consciously selecting, which is not good. Herbert Spencer came up with a thing called survival of the fittest. And Darwin co-opted it, thought it was a good term, and he used it. And he acknowledged Spencer. But it's not good. It's not true. It's survival of the sufficient. It's survival of what's good enough. And it doesn't have to be that good. Uh, think about your hearing. Think about your eyesight, right? Think about our bodies. Do you guys wake up? Woo! You know, I got like a 13 year old kid, right? When he was six years old, he got out of bed and go, oh, I'm tired. I go, you're six, dude. I don't feel that good today. I'm 50 years older than you, man. Right? So, survive. No, I can almost end this sound again. Sexist. I apologize. Women. Are you dating? Sorry. The, of course, he is the best. But I mean, oh, the oh, best oh. of all males. Now, just point that out. There's three billion guys on the planet. I know you could be swiping a lot of pictures left, right? right, 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 right. But just think about that. No, I know the answer. In sociology, they, you know, of course, you remember in sociology, they come up with the most complicated, complicated term for the simplest thing. Always remember. In physics, they always come up with the simplest term for the most complicated thing. Because physics is most fundamental. Physics, when they talk about a, a gravitationally imploded object, they call it a black hole. When they talk about the origin of the universe of 13.8 billion years ago, they go, Big Bang. <laughs> in sociology, when you date somebody in your neighborhood, or somebody in your hood, which they could say, you know, you date people in your hood, right? They don't say that. Residential propiquity. <laughs> sociology. <laughs> now, Highfalutin terms probably because they have physics in them, but no, that's the point I'm trying to make. Is that, are you really dating the best of all three billion guys? No, I know what the answer is. He's good enough. He's got pants. He's taking me to supersize McDonald's. Let's go. Let's move it off. It's good enough. And that meets the minimum threshold because if you think about it, that's exactly why our bodies decay. 
Because nature says, well, you've lived long enough, you've done your job, and get out. Now, that also explains why consciousness is kind of a mess. We end up with Alzheimer's and all sorts of dementia, all sorts of brain degenerations and all sorts of things. But the funny thing about it is that we're being tricked about reality. We've never seen reality. This is Hoffman's point. That's why he made the desktop analogy. But I think with virtual reality, not to scare you, but it's getting so freaking good that within 10 years, no doubt about it, you will not be able to tell the difference between reality and a simulation. And it's already happened. As you know, Alan Turing, very famous uh, 1936 paper on computable numbers. If you ever get a chance to read it, which is somewhat impossible to read, but it's, it's very impressive. Look at the coffee table, walk around, what are you been reading? Turing's original paper. I don't know what you're doing. Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code, what happened? So, so what happened? So what happened was, I know it's I can't, but I don't even know. Because Origin was a fun book, the last one they just came out. So, you know, so but um, the the funny thing is, what Turing did in '36, of course, is develop basically the understanding of zeros and ones in a computational way to develop any kind of computer, any kind of universal computer, for which we should be very happy. But in 1950. Because he's really impressive, really smart guy. He said, what happens when a machine can mimic a human being so well that we won't be able to tell the difference? And you know it's called the Turing test. And it's become fairly famous. And it's been somewhat passed, not perfectly. It's getting good. You know, Siri still sucks, but you know, Google Voice is getting better. And we're starting to get these kind of robocalls where you think somebody's really talking to you and it's not. You know. Well. The Turing test has already been passed in one place, and you know it, in movies. CGI effects have gotten so good that I'm having difficulty. You know, I saw Life of Pi, and I thought that was a real great movie, right? And I saw, like, this Jungle Book movie. Have you seen this thing? I see those animals. I think they're really animals. They're not. When I was brought up back in the day when, you know, when special effects who were like a string on a fish, you know, and we would be young and go, look, I can see the string, those special effects suck. <laughs> well, after 2001, the Space Odyssey were special effects really took a transformation. Uh, today it's gotten so good, as you know, if you just saw the Avengers, I won't give away the plot. If you see the Avengers, you start to see, God, they do amazing jobs. Or if you saw Ready Player One, you can see yeah. all sorts of amazing things. Now, what am I trying to get this to understand? Well, guess what? We're in simulation now. Not, 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 not talking about Ray Kurzweil's you know, the singularity in 2045. I'm talking about we're, right now we're in a simulation. Your brain is simulating this. And we buy it. And we think this is reality. This is what Immanuel Kant, by the way, one of the reasons philosophy turned on its head, and I'll be sure you know in about a minute, um, one of the reasons Immanuel Kant turned philosophy on its head is because most of us have asked questions about the universe as an objective, you know, like, why is this happening? What's this about? You know, what's the purpose of the universe, blah, blah, blah. And Emmanuel Kant pointed out to the wait a second. Maybe it's our mind that's skewing the questions. That is, instead of asking, you know, why, maybe we should ask the question, why do we ask why? That is, Wittgenstein does the same thing in the 20th century. He says the very usage of language, he, you know, made the argument 90% of philosophy could be resolved. We just used good language. That's why he developed the book. Probably the only book he ever published, Tracticus, in which he tried to come up with like a perfect language that never worked. He eventually realized that language is like a game. The argument that was being made was that our brains, well, guess what? They don't see things as they are, as Kant says. Like it's like it's almost like as if we were born with blue sunglasses from birth. And you walked around and you think, well, that's blue, that's blue, this way, this And then all of a sudden somebody goes, no, no, dude, take the sunglasses off. Or, Take the glasses off, and reality is completely freaking different. We know this from quantum mechanics. You know, this is one of the weird things. You know, this is the reason Einstein hated quantum mechanics. Because he was arguing with Niels Bohr. They both won the Nobel Prize the same year, although it's sort of been different with World War I, we went into detail. But what? You take this chair, and you think this chair is solid. I think it's solid, right? For me, it is solid. But according to quantum mechanics, it's 99.999% empty space. In fact, everything is empty space. If you take an atom, think of a magnificent St. Paul Cathedral in London. And if you walked into it and imagined that was an atom, well, where's the nucleus? Well, the nucleus would be like a bumblebee on its floor. And everything else would be space. And the electron, of course, is very small, and it's a hydrogen atom, which is the simplest of all atoms. You know, it manifests around. Most of the energy. So what the hell? How does this all work? How did this happen? Well, 
guess what? It turned out that when planets you know, became congealed and when the solar system was developed, human beings emerged very temporarily. Very, you know, think about life, guys. It sounds really weird, but I get a big debate on the internet about this. But, you know, life is very temporary. You, know, you see a little snail, you see an ant, he's like, I'm alive, you live. I step up, he's gone. You know, human beings, we think we live for a long time. Dude, we only lived to 45 in the 19th century. By the time Jesus was around, I think it was back then it was about 33 or 34. It's mostly brutish. It's mostly suffering. And it's very temporary. And it's not very good if you looked at it objectively. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have to then ask yourself, ah, how do these people navigate this thing? Well, nature is the trick. Nature is the biggest lie there is. Well, think about it. Do you know there's thousands, maybe millions of lights in your hair right now? Do you know that? Do you really want to know that? Do you know there's more cancer? There's cancer in Earth right now. We're just debating whether it mutates or not. There's more E. coli bacteria in the gut of our stomach than all the stars in the universe. I don't want to know that. It freaks me out. So nature goes, don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. It's going to be the horses that don't want races. We're going to put blinders on. We're going to congeal your brain. And the universe is going to say, your brains were not evolved to understand the universe. Your brain's evolved to eat the universe. <laughs> yeah. Think about a squirrel, right? The squirrel, you think about you know, human beings, we're so arrogant. You know, you have a bunch of human beings together, you know, one guy's got a turban, a third eye patch, being blown by unseen winds with a rug, you know. Everybody's sitting around, and, oh yeah, Baba the numbers. Baba the numbers, right? Well, just think about a bunch of squirrels, okay? or uh, cows, a bunch of cows. And they're looking at the sun or the moon, and they're going, moo, 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 moo. And everybody's trying to interpret the moon. Well, that's heavy moonness. That's Heidegger moonness. You know, I can't even understand that stuff. How many thoughts can you hold in your mind simultaneously at any point? Four to seven. Just think about that. We can only hold four to seven thoughts. Let me just give you a different analogy. And I'll shut up at seven thirty. But watch this. Let's imagine. I've done this to my classes, but it's really helpful. I want you to imagine this white screen represents all the books that can be published in the human history. Gujarati, Russian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Korean, whatever, okay? And imagine you wanted to make a dent upon the body of knowledge. And you said to yourself, I'm going to live 100 years. I'm going to read, let's push it, five books a day for 100 years. Yeah, like one of the speed guys. How big of a dent would you make? Now, you can do this math, right? You can do it, right? How big of a dent would we make? You wouldn't see it. The dot would be imperceptible. All of this would remain unread. Which means that human beings have just a really tiny bit of knowledge. And from that, we extrapolate the universe data. We know what's going on. We don't have it. We're called quarks. You know, I thought he got it from James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake, but having read his autobiography, it's not true. Nevertheless, these quarks come six in number. Now, what's a quark, guys? What is it? Now, you think about an electron. The electrons manifest a thing called electromagnetic energy called a photon. It travels 186,000 miles per second inside a vacuum. What is light? Feel it. You already know the answer. You've always known the answer. What is it? Nobody knows. <laughs> Sir, I don't know is the three greatest words in the human language. Sir Arthur Eddington, who was the guy who confirmed Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity on an expedition off the coast of West Africa, where Einstein predicted that light should bend around a massive object during a solar eclipse, he said, and I quote him, brilliant guy, he said, something unknown is doing what I don't know. That's quantum mechanics. Feynman says anybody who thinks they understand quantum, uh, quantum mechanics doesn't. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So I guess I want to leave you with this one uh, idea. And by the way, I have copies of books for everybody. I think everybody. If we don't, I'll give you one. Uh, called The Virtual Reality of Consciousness and Gnostic Insight, which kind of covers what I've been saying. But there's a little movie, if I have time to show you a movie for four minutes, I think you'll dig it. Can we Does anyone have any uh, questions? Oh, I think so. Oh, I'm pretty sure they are. All right, I'll break it. Yeah, there's one. Or, like, like, if you have a question, go for it. Um, uh, 
Um, okay, so I, I, I was wondering like about just how, how you're defining consciousness. Like I, I've heard the, the way I normally think about it is like, well, we have a first person sort of experience. And I'm not sure how that's so related to coming out of evolution. Like why, why couldn't animals just come up with a way of like simulating things like a computer without this first person? Well, let's play it out. What, what, let's play it out. What happens when you have the sense of quality, as you mentioned, the subject of food? What does it make you do that would be different than, let's say, the instinctual aspects that we all do unconsciously through the reptilian brain? Well, what does it do? It gives you a sense of feeling. Sorry. <laughs> it gives you a sense of a cricket in your pocket. <laughs> so, yeah, what would you think? I mean, what does it do to you? I mean, like, I'm not sure that it would be very different from a computer, which is good at... So you're making, a, I understand, you're you're making the argument that the computer would not have that quality. Or like, it, it would have all of the... I, I, I know it's like rhetorical, like, oh, we just assume that computers aren't conscious or whatever, but um, I'm, but I, at least to me it seems like if there's the possibility that computers aren't conscious and computers could do the same thing that we do in terms of what you're saying about simulating uh, various futures, if there's that possibility, then it seems like... Why wouldn't evolution favor that? Like, like, like why, yeah, why would evolution turn out with the first person experience instead of... Right, well that's a zombie, zombie hypothesis. And a lot of people have made this argument that it's a zombie hypothesis of consciousness. And therefore, Chalmers, David Chalmers, who's, I think he's at NYU now, he studied at Santa Cruz, and he's written this book called The Conscious Mind, which became real famous because he talked about consciousness being the hard problem. And he would dovetail with what you're saying. He's suggesting that we cannot come up, he doesn't believe, with a really good scientific explanation for why consciousness emerges. You know, in fact, he always wants to argue like it's a force, like electromagnetism. It's like something of its own, of its own nature. My feeling, though, is just to, just to ask yourself this thing. I'm in love with my wife. I know it sounds sick, but I do. I love my wife a lot. And so I have this, like, this feeling, I get, this feeling of different various emotions that play in my mind. And what do I do? Just play out what we do. We respond to it. So the question is, what advantage is having quality in terms of evolution? That's what I would argue. It doesn't mean I'm right. It just means that that's the argument that's been made. Is okay. that if you look at, like for instance, if you take the zombie hypothesis, and I wouldn't disagree with you, but what would be lacking in a zombie that would a human being would have that would be different in terms of quality? Okay, sh sure, there, then there's no qualia, but if it ends up acting the same way because you've got physical things bumping around in there. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very interesting you say this. I like it, and I'll tell you why. Because on one level, Ramachandran has made this argument that we developed self reflective awareness as a secondary effect, not a primary one, to predict the behaviors of other people. So we came up with models, like how you're going to behave and how you're going to act. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're suggesting is an interesting one, because to be frank with you, I don't know if anybody in this room has subjective quality. Right? All I see is behavior. Mm -hmm. I look at your eyes, you know, the way you look, and mm -hmm. I intuit it. So some people, like even Daniel Dennett, mm -hmm. in a book called Consciousness Explained, he'll explain it away. He'll simply make the same argument you've made. Like maybe that's maybe it's just it's just an illusion. And maybe computers can do the same thing. So what I would argue, and this is where Hoffman comes and the first consciousness people appear, they said, look, you have quality. This is, you know, it's like John Cyril makes the same argument at Berkeley, although he's been defaced lately. But, yes. but I, I understand your point. And that's, again, that's what's so cool about it, right? It's, we're still at this very rudimentary stage. You know, we're just trying to come up with models as best we can. So, so then, is your position that um, consciousness it could be the second order effect, that the way we act is evolutionarily determined, and part of what happens in the brain is that it models potential futures, however, like, just because we model potential futures, it, that doesn't necessarily 
imply that we automatically now have first person experiences. No, no, like, you're absolutely right. You're like absolutely right. A, a computer. You're absolutely right. I would imagine, you know, like, let's play it out. I mean, I don't know, of course. Yeah. A dog might have. Seems to me a dog is conscious, a dog seems self aware. But he may not have the kind of repertoire that we have. The argument about simulation is that you just get more options. Now, interesting, I like what you're saying, because on one level you could say, we could have more simulations without quality. And that's been an argument that's been made in philosophy. So, so then, is your argument about consciousness in terms of first-person experience, or consciousness in terms of some other thing about qualities of how we act, and part of how we I act? I think they're intertwined. I don't think, you just, I don't think they're separate. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Just like right now, we're having this feeling, and we have emotions rise up, thinking. I don't think we're mutually exclusive. Now, let's so, play out. So let's what, play out different. Yeah. So, 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 what does quality add? I'm, I'm wondering. Well, I, let's play out what quality adds in terms of the way you relate to other human beings. Your sense of feeling about them. Your sense of like maybe I'll hurt your feelings, or maybe I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, or maybe mm -hmm. like as a parent, for instance, I'm always thinking about my kids, and that that quality, that feeling that I get adds a complete different dimension to my existence. Also, maybe this could happen. It also gives you a sense of purpose and meaning, a reason of living. Because look, look, play out this different, this is more, more existential. I mean, think of the Hunger Games, because I, I, the first one, I didn't like the other three. <laughs> Thank you. In, uh, in, the Hunger Games, in the Hunger Games, I only use this as an analogy, not because it's a good movie, but it's just that everything, we're all going to end up dead. And it's a tough life. People get sick, they get AIDS, they get cancer. People, you know, animals eat other animals. All sorts of torturous things are happening. Now, on one level, when I saw Hunger Games, I said to myself, why play the game? Just off it. Yep. Get the fudge out now. This place sucks. Well, we're in the Hunger Games. Like, if I told you, go to Disneyland, and I said that Walt Disney had developed a place called Carnival Land. And the only way out of Disneyland is you've got to eat another person or another <laughs> animal. You know, you would probably say, this guy's a sick bastard. We're there. We're in carnivore land, unquestioned, even if you're a vegan. And I like vegans. Okay, keep going. Don't buy my propaganda. Just remember, we're all, one of the great things about human beings is that what we want to do is come up with models, and in science, this is what's great, and find out every weakness of that. Because remember, every map has a gap. That's why science progresses, because it looks at a map and says, Lane before it. Crap. Find the gap, like, like you do in London. And that's what's so fun about it, because we don't want to be so like dogmatic in our position. Like, I was probably dogmatic in the 80s about consciousness being first. Church would kick my ass. Right on. And even today, I know I'm going to be wrong. I've been living a long freaking time. You know, what's a PhD stand for? Phenomenally dumb. What's an MS? Bullshit. <laughs> That's a BS. That's bullshit. What's an AS? That even shit. It's associated shit, I call it. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> after that, no question. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one over there. No. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm processing some stuff. Hold on. <laughs> I'm there? processing that AS. <laughs> <laughs> There's one. Right. So, so, I guess this is maybe not as related a question, but to, to what extent can we say that? being a person and a computer are different, and that computers are not conscious. Um, and is, is there a difference between being a person or simulating It's a well? great question, and this is what's so cool about this notion that consciousness is substrate neutral. See, people like Tanoni have come up with this integrated theory, information, I don't know if you've heard about this. And the argument is this. If consciousness is just information, you know, because it's neurons, let's say we have 86 billion, and those neurons have synapses and axions and connections. And let's imagine we come up with a simulated model of such. Or we reverse engineer the brain so that we take every neuron and we replace it with a silicon chip. You know, we do it imperceptibly. You know. And if all of a sudden we did it well enough, the question arises, would that person still be conscious? Now, if that person is still conscious, we now realize that it's a simulation by silicon chips, which means that it's substrate neutral or substrate independent, which means that we could have computation in 50 years, where there's self-reflective awareness. Whether they have self-reflective awareness is not the issue. The question is, we would think they did. That's what Turing meant in 1950. That's what we mean, even in this classroom. I don't know, maybe there's some zombies in here, right? Some people came from Mars. You know, they're augmenting the class. So the question that arises, 
It's only to our benefit, here comes Daniel Dennett, called intentional stances, by I impute upon you certain kinds of behavior. Whether you have it or not, that's a different issue. In fact, I'll put this more radically. We will never know the mind of another human being. We will only know their behavior of that mind and how we react to it. But I'm just kind of thinking about how that ties into the you know, concept of theory of mind, the ability to predict another person's thoughts and therefore their actions. I mean, I was reading a book type, you know, that talks about you know, you know, the subliminal thought and you know, the neuroscience that goes into every action and it was talking about how humans can go up to seven or eight degrees of, you know, of theory of mind. You know, I'm plotting out one reaction to another, and also how this is probably how you know, the human, you know, human intelligence developed because we had developed such wise social circles. I mean, I was just, I was just thinking that entire matter of trying to understand another person. I mean, while it is futile, it has. Our evolutionary oh, you know, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. It's obvious to our advantage for me to try to predict your behavior. You're absolutely correct. All I meant by it was, can I get in the insides know, of somebody's thinking? It's just something answers. I wanted to bring up. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I mean, yeah. I had uh, David Woodruff Smith's class. I don't know if you have talked. You guys talked before? Who? You got, uh, David Woodruff Smith? No, I don't know. You guys should definitely talk. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, uh, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting is that uh, he had brought up to me that uh, I forgot because I don't want to like miscite people. And also, I want to make, make another reference. Crip didn't technically do the do the homework for the the PNA thing. You're talking about Rosalind Franklin? Franklin? Yes. Yeah. I know, I know. Just for clarification. No, I know and you're right. And JP, that the person that everybody forgets is Maurice Wilkin. Because mm. Rosalind uh, Franklin worked with Maurice Wilkin, maybe even longer now. And she got sabotaged. You know, she would have won the Nobel Prize most likely she didn't die. But they don't give Nobel Prizes to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shame. But that aside, yeah. uh, he was saying that uh, one of the more interesting theories is that your brain isn't actually creating consciousness, but it's actually acting as a receiver for consciousness. Yeah, yeah. This and is a like very, this is a, convenience. yeah, that's a great, you raise a great issue. In fact, that's the huge debate. You know, I got to debate with people who argue this. You know, they say, look, you got it all wrong. The brain doesn't create consciousness, you point out. It's a receiver. Because of its complexity, it can manifest a certain way. Now, let me just get a little controversial. I just think that begs the question. The reason I think it begs the question is that you're saying some, something else is transmitting it, right? So the question is, what is transmitting it? You know, where does that come from? So you're, you're like, we're moving the question away. Now, granted, it may be true. You know, it may be that case. The problem, though, is it doesn't resolve the problem. And the other thing I get into, and I get people mad at me about I think a very practical approach to this. What I mean is I think of William James at Harvard and practical approach to me, and I have this thing called the remainder conjecture. Because I've done a lot of, you know, I exposed cults when I was young, I got sued and death threats, blah, blah, blah. And so what happened was people believed in the paranormal. You know, they believed in Satya Sai Baba and Miracle. I simply said this. I said, look, let's let's physically exhaust every ex explanation we have, you know, physics and chemistry and biology, intertheoretic reductionism. Just do it. Now, if it turns out, like you point out, that we can't explain consciousness, you know, like it is a receiver, we will have actually a remainder, you know, like a division. Something that would say, shit, this physicality doesn't explain it. Which, in a weird way, would be a suggestive evidence to look in that direction. Mm -hmm. But if we don't exhaust the physics of consciousness first, okay. we will make all sorts of mistakes. We'll start believing that Sai Baba has miracle powers. And we'll back. That's that side of him. Yeah, you get a hand. I mean, yeah, there's so um, you believe the brain generates reality, right? Or I, mean, I think maybe I'll, I'll quote Aldous Huxley from Doors uh -huh. of Perception. Ooh, I think it filters it. My question, I guess, is so filters you you mean it in like contributes a part of reality, right? Yeah, very good. Constructs. I guess my question is, it feels like our perception of the world is so perfect, yet the brain is an imperfect organ. How would you explain that? Because how, how perfect is our eyesight? Like, <laughs> my hearing, for instance, you guys know, you should download this app. I'm a grandma, so let me get this back. Download this app. It's called the Sound Grenade. 
and, and, and you may have heard this. And the sound grenade is like, when you're 20, you can hear the sound. When you're 30, some people can't hear it. When you're 40, my brother, I did it with my brother, we're playing frisbee golf. I go, Joe, can you hear this? They can't hear it, this is all like me. He goes, you're making this up, this doesn't make any sound. Where everybody around, I go, turn that freaking thing off. You know, the reason I say this to women is that when you date some guy who claims that he's younger than he really is, you know, some guy that claims he's young, you're on a date with him, you just turn on the sound grenade. So, dude, can you hear this? Oh, I guess you're 50, not 30, is the joke. But along those lines, the argument being made is that our, our perceptions of reality are very limited. You know, our hearing's not very good, our sense of smell is clearly not that good, not compared to a dog. So that's, that's kind of what I'm going to do. Okay, back off that for a second. Uh, yes. Uh, one of the things I was kind of like playing around with in my head for a while was like, is it possible for human beings to reach, uh, like, AI level of capabilities mentally, like our, our faculties are like as as skillful as a machine's that's designed to do these things. And in some ways that we technically have like outperform certain machines because I guess like we don't have the like nature engineered us much more in a much more sophisticated fashion than uh, if we were just to like try and copy its homework, right? And my guess is like I have a feeling that part of the what makes consciousness a thing is that we don't have all data, or not. It's that we are filtering and bothering to be like it's the imperfection that makes the consciousness. If we were to have all the necessary data, and we'd be kind of like a robot, and like the robot doesn't really live because it has all the like necessary information. It's not. It, it may be incapacitated because it has too much. But along those lines, as you know, Elon Musk wants to develop this thing called the neural lakes, where we kind of merge with computational intelligence. My dad, back in the 67, told me that there will never be a computer that can beat a grandmaster of chess. Well, in 1987, he was completely wrong. The most surprising thing happened two years ago when the most sophisticated player in Go, which is this Asian oh, yeah. Alpha Go, beat 100 to 0, beat him under like 10 to 0. Then they developed another uh, computer that beat that computer 100 to 0. He goes, what Ray Kurzweil calls it, the law of accelerating returns. It's simply, it's a really cool concept. It's the idea that computers, because they can work 24-7, can develop incredible abilities that you and I will never be able to do. One example is if I, let's imagine there's 300 squares in this room. There's not, but let's just imagine, okay? And I take one M&M, and I put the M&M here, okay? And I double the M&M here, and then I double it again. You know, double, 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 and we do 300 squares. Now play this out. How many M&Ms would we have in this room by the 300th square? Take a guess. By the way, I reckon this off from max tech marks that out of the universe. Nice. More M&Ms than all the stars, I'm sorry, all the atoms in the universe. Just put that out in your head. What? Uh, 300 squares. You can do the math. More M&Ms than all the atoms. Now, what does Ray Kurzweil mean by this? He says, look, Moore's law, which is going away, computers were doubling you know, every 18 months. So when you have computational intelligence, that's why he's all, everybody's all freaked out. You know, that's why Bill Gates scared of it. You know, uh, Stephen Hawking scared of it. Because they think, oh my god, they're going to take over the planet. Terminator, yeah. Art 9. Yeah. But that's raised the issue you said. And it's a good one. Computers are really good at one thing. Hmm. They're not really good at multiplicity of things. Where you and I are. So we have a huge advantage. And I think there was one question. What will be the last one? Okay, so this is piggybacking off of uh, what you were saying about um, so, like the, the brain filtering con like reality to consciousness. It reminds me of what people talk about, you know, like homunculi in, in, in the mind. Like you've got things in the world, and then you've got like a little person sitting inside the head, and then the brain just like takes all the information and projects it in a certain way for the homunculi who's just sitting in the head, and they're like, oh, okay, I guess that's reality then, but they're really only seeing the screen inside the head. Like, are you, like, it's, but what makes the homunculi consciousness? Is there a homunculi inside the homunculi? Goes the argument. And like, where does this stop? Why, why do we... Why do people argue that there's only one homunculi? What does that even mean to say that there's some consciousness which is seeing something like 
through the brain, which is detached from the brain somehow? Like, what, what do you... You know, Sam think? Harris, you guys probably know Sam Harris. Sam Harris is a pretty famous neuroscientist. You know, he went to Stanford, dropped out, did drugs, went to India for 10 years, then came back about the end of faith. You know, he's one of the four horsemen of atheism. Right. He wrote the best book on meditation I've ever read, and I've read a lot. And this is called Waking Up. And he makes an argument, and you probably read it, that there is no self. That it's an illusion. Daniel Dennett makes the same argument. And that is what he says when you meditate, because he does this thing called the spasana or uh, mindfulness. And he says the more you explore your own consciousness, you'll find that there is no such thing. That there's no self. self. There's no feels. It's an illusion. Now, the problem, I like Sam a lot, but the problem is, of course, you still have this feeling that you have a self. Right? I mean, you just do. Unless, of course, you meditate a lot, then that self is also you go to sleep. So, um, so that's the interesting question. Daniel Dennett will make the argument called the theater of the mind. And he makes the argument that there is no core self. There is no mind. That's an illusion that we develop. So, what do you think? There's what do I think? I mean, I'm stupid. <laughs> My feeling about this, to be quite frank with you, is that I feel like I'm a monkey. And, you know, Richard Feynman once said, you know, he feels stupid all the time because he wants to, he's like a monkey trying to get a banana off something and he tries to take two sticks to get it. And he's trying his best. What I have realized is my brain has such limited models. I just try to keep my mind open to always know one thing. I am always potentially wrong. So I try never to hold a position too strong. I think about it, like you know about science. You know, I, you know Newton was great for two centuries until Einstein comes around. It comes up with a bunch of wider theory of gravity. So my feeling is that in 2019, there's one thing I'm pretty certain. I'm going to be full of crap. Okay. Uh, uh, we have time for like one more question, I think. OK, we got a minute, so. OK, um, so, I'll make it, uh, so I'll make it very quick. Um, so when you were talking about how we make these models as humans, I was sort of thinking about uh, paradigm theory how we make these worldviews called paradigms. And in the history of science, we've gone through paradigm through paradigm. Um, so I guess if I were to like learn physics, for example, and I learn about these like different models made by established physicians, uh, what do you think happens if I were to like make my own like revolutionary paradigm? Do I just do I just uh, take in reality and make my own model, or is there something else to it? Explain a little further what you mean. I mean, Thomas Kuhn, as you know, very famous for this, uh, the structure of scientific revolutions. It's a very famous book, published in 1962. And he was the one who really kind of coined that term paradigm. And he made an argument that the problem with science is oftentimes you're stuck with a certain paradigm. And let's say you come up with a radical like thought. And the problem is it won't uh, fit. It won't fit the grid. Now, it takes time. But one of the things here goes, science is really a series of guesses that we make. And then we test those guesses, we repeat those guesses against other guesses. So I would suggest evidence will win out. That is, if you can come up with something that, of predictive power that nobody could have predicted before, Einstein's theory you know, of relativity, special theory 1905, general theory 1916, he never won the Nobel Prize for that. He won the Nobel Prize for something a little more conservative, even the radical, called the photoelectric effect. Mm -hmm. It took years to prove that theory, or not prove, but to give evidence to it. So I think it may take a while. If you come up with a radical, it may take a while. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. And that will conclude the.